And we're going to begin actually at verse number. <sighs> Let me see here. I, I almost am tempted to think to go into something. Let's start at verse seven because I'm seeing something here, and I said, well, maybe I can cover kill two birds with one stone this morning. Matthew 19, beginning at verse 7, if we'd stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. And the Word of the Lord reads, I read today from the New King James text, They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. His disciples said to him, if such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. Now, I'm going to stop for one quick second. Don't you think for two seconds these guys were talking about living a sexless life? Amen. They said, if that's the case, then it's better not to marry. In other words, we'll, we'll, we'll have our flings and we'll do our thing, but we just won't marry. Because if it's, if it's such that we divorce someone for any other reason but what you've stated that then we're committing adultery if we remarry, then it's better that we not marry at all. Okay? These guys, there is this mentality, you know, that in the conservative, right-wing, religious, fanatical circles, and they try to tell us that in biblical times, people lived like they tried to tell us to live. Premarital sex is off. You don't, you don't dare do anything premarital. That's the most evil, awful, hideous thing you could possibly do. Why, well, that falls under the definition of fornication. Well, I got news for you. No, it doesn't, but that's beside the point. Then, All right, but I, I just, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to try to hit about two different birds here and see if I have enough rocks to do it. Let's continue for a minute. Okay. He goes on to say, his disciples said to him, If such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. He said to them, All cannot accept this saying, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake, he who is able to accept it or to understand it, let him accept it. Then little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed from there. Master, we thank you, God, for this morning. We thank you for your word. Help me, Lord, to deliver something that might be a benefit to your people today. Help me, God, to say something that might lift up a heart, that might encourage someone. God, that might help them to find faith in you they've never before have known. Master, today, allow your anointing to flow this hour, even for this word of exhortation. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated this morning. I actually was going to just kind of exhort a little bit on the very bottom portion of that concerning the children. And let the children come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven, because there's, there's such an important principle in that. And in order not to waste time, because I'm running so late this morning, I'm going to tell you what the Lord was showing me and what the Lord was speaking to me this morning about that. And he was speaking to me, and he said, You know, when I said, don't forbid the children, for of such is the kingdom of heaven, I was making a clear and simple point. And that point is that in every human being there is a child. 
In every human being, there is a child. The majority of who you are today was developed and established by the time you were five years old. Do you know that? The majority of who you are. If your parents were such that they encouraged you to steal or they didn't punish you for doing wrong when you were a young child, then chances are you've become an adult who doesn't mind lifting products off a shelf at a grocery store and walking out without paying for it. Because much of your uh, who you are and much of the standards by which you live are established when you're still just a little, little child. But the Lord was saying to me, he said, the reason that I told them don't forbid the children because the entire kingdom of God is made up of children. The entire kingdom of God is made up of children. He says, all my kids are kids. All my kids are kids. When I look at them, I can see right down to the hurt that happened when they were 12 years old that makes them to this day act the way they do. When I look down at my children, I can see to this day the painful experience that they endured when they were 14 that makes them react to that situation or that kind of situation the way that they do today because no matter how old we get I've got an aunt that's in her 70s and she and my uncle will be coming and singing for us sometime soon and I go generally during the week and visit with her she's 75 so you know nobody lives forever so I try to spend time with her every week and it's amazing to me as I sit and visit with her how, as I listen to her talk, this woman, 75 years old, and she's still living with hurts that are 70 years old. Hey, do you hear me? She's still living with bruises that are 65 and 70 years old. She still has scars, some of them that are over 70 years old. Why? Because inside of every one of us is a child. The truth and the reality of human existence is our outward man grows and matures and changes as we get older. But, honey, your inward man stays the same. You know, the Bible said that the outward man perisheth, but the inward man is renewed day after day. It's constantly renewed. So the inward man kind of retains that youthfulness. The inward man, that's how you get these 80-year-old guys, you know, like Jack LaLanne, and, you know, he gets out there and he's ready to pull a boat with his teeth or whatever. The man's 175 years old, and he still wants to do stuff like this. Why? Because on the inside, he feels good. On the outside, he looks like... I don't know what he looks like. I don't know how to, how to describe that, but... But you see, what we, what we are on the outside isn't always reflected by what we feel on the inside. And I was with Jason for five years. My great-grandmother, whom I love dearly, this lady was precious to me. She told him one day, she says, don't hurt him. Don't hurt him. She said, because... He is a grown man. Uh, excuse me. He is a little boy in a grown man's body. Talking about me. She said, he's just a little boy in a grown man's body. And do you know so many times I think, and I, I, I kind of have really seriously, I, I do a lot of self. I don't know about you, but the Bible said, let a man examine himself. Now, that doesn't mean a breast examination, you know. But that might not hurt every once in a while. I don't know. But that's not necessarily what it's talking about. But it says, let a man examine himself. And I think that a lot of times, one of the biggest problems Christians have is that we're so busy examining everybody else, and we never take time to look at ourselves. And when we do look at ourselves, we're never honest. Amen. We don't want to be honest. No, that hurts too much. That's too hard. I don't want to be honest. 
But you know what, Juan? I've learned over the years that if there's anybody in the world that I can take criticism from and not really have too bad a reaction, it's me. So if I look in the mirror and I see something I don't like, then all I have to do is say, hey, Charles, man, we got to change that, buddy. we got to work on that because that's no good. Now, if you said it to me, I'd probably chop you in the block. <laughs> but if I say it to me, I can handle it better. But one thing that I've always tried to do when I sit and examine myself, I try desperately to be honest and not let my pride and my ego and my, you know, self get in the way so that I can't be truthful and honest about what I'm seeing. I remember years ago, I was just a teenager, and I had grown up with a father who was not a Christian, still isn't, and he was a very negative man, very nasty man. Everything he saw, he had some to say, and none of it was good. And here I was trying to serve the Lord. I'd born and raised in the Assemblies of God, and I was trying to be a good Christian boy, you know, and, and I wanted to do right. But without realizing it, I emulated my dad in that regard. I'd see something. Look at that woman in that hat. She looks about as stupid as anything I've seen. Good grief. Who she thinks she is? Dale Rogers, you know? Shove a piece of fried chicken in her mouth and we can make a commercial. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and that's what I would do. Constantly. Very critical of everything that I saw. Everything that I saw. Gee, isn't that sweater a little long on him? Couldn't he get one that fit him better? Gee, uh, that coat really doesn't look good on him because, you know, and and just pick people apart. And worse than that, I had a habit. When someone would come to me and say anything, anything, just like my father, I would find something negative to respond with. This one day I'm in church and Barbara Rick, a young lady I grew up with, I wonder she never wanted to run off and marry me when I, when I look at kind of personality I had and you know honestly I'm saying that and I mean that from the depth of my heart when I look back and realize the kind of personality I had as a kid it's no wonder I didn't have as many friends and you know and I didn't date or whatever and uh, because I mean it, my ne that negativity and all was horrible and one day Barbara comes and says oh Chuck guess what what they're putting a skating rink in downtown Naugatuck and I said, really? Immediately without thinking, my mouth kicked into gear, and I began to quote what I had heard my father say on this exact subject when he was talking about a skating rink coming into town. Now, y'all are going to think it's dumb, but remember, it originated with my father and not with me. Well, you know what comes with things like skating rinks. The mob, crime, drugs, prostitution. Oh, I was just convinced that every bad thing in town was going to come because we had a skate rink now. And Barbara, bless her heart, the countenance of her face fell, and I saw it. And she just, well, and turned and walked away. Have an Uncle Stephen. I love Stephen, but I, I can't say he's one of my favorite people. And my Uncle Stephen was standing nearby, and he came over to me. And his catchphrase, Stephen, if you ever hear this message, he's famous for saying, doggone it. Doggone it. Doggone it. I think he, he gones more dogs than I've ever seen in my life. And he goes, doggone it, Chuck. He says, good Lord, it's a miracle if, if you ever have a friend in this world and blah, blah, because doggone it, you just can't talk like that. Every time somebody says something, you sound like your father and you come out with that negative junk. Well, of course, my immediate reaction was, yeah, you I know where you can put that, buddy, oh boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
but I didn't say anything to him. But I guarantee you my eyes were squinted. My nose was crunched up. My teeth were clenched. I really don't want to hear this, and I certainly don't want to hear it from you. But I didn't say that. I just kept my mouth shut. And I went home. And when I got home and I got into the privacy of my bedroom, I started thinking about what Stephen said. And I, just like I do today, I tried to be as honest as I could. And I said, Lord have mercy, do I really do that? Could it be possible that what Stephen said is true? That I honestly do do that? And I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I realized, oh, Jesus, you know what? I do do that. And it is just like my father. And I know my father's not a Christian, and I know that his behavior is not anything I want to emulate. So I begin to pray, Lord, help me to change that behavior, because I hate that. I don't want to be like that. And at first I said, Lord... Just take it away from me. Just remove that bad behavior from my vocabulary, so to speak. And the Lord came back with an answer and said, no. He says, I can't take it away. I said, well, Lord, sure you can take it away. Why can't you take it away? He said, because if I take it away, you're going to have a big empty spot and you fill it with something. Then chances are you fill it with the same thing that was there before. Because before too long, you fall right back into the old habits. He said, no, let me tell you how it works. He said, if you've got something in your life that you don't want there, instead of taking it away and then just trying to keep from doing it again, he said, don't do that. He said, what you've got to do is this. You've got to replace it with another behavior. He said, start doing something else in, in direct contradiction to what you were doing so that this way you're not doing nothing and you're not doing what you were doing, but you're doing the exact opposite of what you were doing, and the, what you're doing now is positive versus the negative. I said, okay, Lord, now how, how does that work? He said, it's easy. Instead of, when somebody says something, instead of immediately letting something negative flow out of your mouth, immediately think to yourself, what can I say positive? What good thing can I say? roller skating rink. Oh, wonderful. I've never had a broken arm before. <laughs> hey, listen, I didn't say I was perfect at this right from the get-go. Okay. It took some time to get in there, all right. Eventually, I got it. But the thing is, no, but, you know, I learned to begin to respond positively to people. But I couldn't just try to stop responding negatively. I had to think of something to do opposite that would replace that negative behavior so that I could, you know. But now all that came about because my Uncle Stephen came and pointed out to me that I was acting like my dad and doing things in a way that wasn't good. I tie my tie. You tie your tie. We tie my tie. Sounds like I'm a bartender. Anyway, uh, I tie my tie a certain way. I've been tying it that way for years. You know why? Because my father showed me how to tie that tie that way. And believe me, my father ever had a, quote, tender moment alone. So this was not like some tender memory. But it was still my dad who showed me how to tie my tie. I've had people try to show me a thousand times how to make a double clicker Windsor knot or a, a, a snicker snobber Windsor knot or whatever they call it. And, honey, I want you to know I couldn't do it for love nor money. You might as well ask me to talk in Japanese because I just can't do it. I sit there and watch them do it. Once, yeah, the little horsey goes around, yeah. Um, then the rabbit climbs through the hole. All right. Uh, then, yeah, then the kangaroo jumps up and down twice. And, uh-huh, yeah, okay. And then the worm goes inside. Uh-huh, all right. I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> you know Why? There's something about the influence of your dad that'll stay with you. 
Your father can show you something, show you how to do. He'll show you how to fish. He could be so wrong. You can never catch a fish a day in your life, and you'll still swear that's the way to fish because your father showed it to you. Am I right? And when somebody comes along and they try to show you a different way or a better way or a new way, you're going, no, 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 this is the way my father taught me. Have you ever caught a fish that way? No. But I'm trying to tell you, if you put a hook on the line, it helps. But my father never put a hook on the line. He just tied a worm on, and, and you know, and the fish was supposed to grab on and hang on. I don't know. But you see, there's something about the influence of our parents even, not just dads, but even moms, when we're young. Because, believe it or not, kids, sometimes I call the church children. You know why I call the church children? Because we're God's children. We're God's people. We're God's kids. And when I'm preaching, I started doing that years ago. Because I noticed that the Lord often spoke and said, little children... Didn't he? When he spoke to his disciples, he said, little children. He spoke to them like they were kids. Because he understood something we don't. That there's a kid inside each and every one of us. Do you know if we would look at each other and we'd stop looking at each other as adults, if we'd stop looking at each other in terms of what we see, in terms of age and wear and tear and all these sorts of things. And Lord knows some of us have less tread on our tires than others. <laughs> these days I'm running bald I'll tell you <laughs> but the idea is if we would learn to look at people and immediately understand I, I, and really I'm telling you dealing with my Aunt Dorothy has really brought this point home to me recently and understand you know I'm looking at a little girl she may be in an old woman's body but she's still a little girl. If we would learn to treat one another as human beings as though we were all children, if we could look at each other and see each other as children and treat each other the way we ought to treat a child. You know, it's funny because the Lord said that it'd be better for a millstone to be tied about somebody's neck and cast into the sea then they offend a child. But you know what? There's a child in every one of us. And if we could only learn that as the people of God, we could have so much better a relationship with one another. We could have so much better uh, an experience with one another. There'd be so little pain. Because we wouldn't be inflicting pain. Because we'd understand you know, sometimes people look at me and say, well, he's hypersensitive. He just, he's so sensitive, you know. He cries when he uses a pay toilet. <laughs> well, I do. You would, too, if you really needed it and didn't have a nickel. <laughs> but the thing is, you know, yes, because, believe it or not, when you look at this old preacher up here, there's a kid in here. There's still a kid in here. And sometimes I wish people would respect that. You know? Like this character sitting here in the third row back. Sometimes, oh, look at him counting rows. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about Juan, Tommy, uh-huh. But, you know, sometimes I think, I wish to God he'd get it and understand that there's a kid in here. No matter how hard I try on the outside to be a, a grown-up, you know, to be a big man, strong man, I still get hurt. My feelings still get wounded. I still can be offended. And you know what? I'll bet you a dime to a donut if I went around this room, every one of you tell me that you have the same experience. No matter what you try to put up on the outside, on the inside, there's always something different going on. Am I telling the truth? Amen. There's always something different. And that's because we are... You remember those little eggs? Those little egg people? You open up Father Egg and there's Mama Egg. Well, you know, obviously he ate quite a bit if he ate his wife, but 
the thing is. <laughs> but you know, you open one egg, and on the inside there's another person, or one. You open up egg person, and and then on the inside there's another person. You open that, there's another person. You open that, there's another person. See, that's what we've got to understand about one another. The Lord said, "Don't, don't forbid the children," because. The reality is, I'm paraphrasing, but what the Lord was really saying was the reality is that in the kingdom of God, for all children, everybody's a child. So therefore, if you if you treat a child a certain way, it's going to live, it's going to last with them forever. Then what's going to happen? Well, after a while, the whole kingdom of God's going to peter out <laughs> because you've done turned all the kids off to wanting to serve God, right? Really, if you, if you didn't have Sunday schools and children's churches and have programs for kids and churches, then what would happen? Well, after a while, the next generation would come up, and they haven't really been exposed to church until they become an adult. And blah, I don't think I want to go to church. I don't think I really care about church. But yet, you can take a child, and you. I used to do children's church for four years in my Assembly God Church up home. I was the children's church director. And... We do our children's church, and I do my puppets, and I do all kinds of neat things, you know, and I did jiggle the clown, you know. Because little did I know that 20 years later I'd live up to the name. <laughs> yeah, I had a hula hoop in my outfit, you know, and it used to just wobble around me as I'd be walking and talking. Nowadays it'd be tight as a pair of Jordache jeans. But, you know, I used to do all these things to get the kids' attention, to help them learn lessons and to understand some concepts of things. And it's wonderful because, you know what, when they grow up and they become a little more mature on the outside, they can still have an interest in the things of God. They can still be interested in going to church. They can still be interested in hearing about Jesus. Because as a kid, they were encouraged to come not discouraged. They were encouraged. Go ahead. The Lord the Lord wants to talk to you. The Lord wants to meet with you. Go ahead. Sing the songs. Pray the prayers. Do the things. It stays with you, doesn't it? Because there's a little kid in every one of us. Now, having said that, I just want to say real quick, I'm going to throw this out as a bonus, okay? If you look at the Lord's comments in this very, just prior to his statement about the children, he was talking about eunuchs. And you see where the Lord talks about the fact that, first of all, you have to understand that he was speaking of eunuchs in the context of marriage, i.e., male-female marital relationships. And the Lord went on to say that, first of all, what I'm about to tell you, everybody can't get except those to whom it is given. You know, sometimes the only people in the world who can understand something are the people who've experienced it. Amen. You can tell me what it is to be a black man in America in the, in the year 2005, and you can tell me all day and all night, and, and that's all well and good. I can empathize, I can try to understand, but I will never know, because I'm not a black man in the, America in the year 2005. So I can't possibly really know. I haven't experienced it. But you know what, Mr. Falwell, don't you get up there and tell me why I'm gay when you have never experienced it. You can't possibly know what the situation is. How in the world is it that all these people have all the answers when they have never been there? The Lord said the only people who are going to get this are the ones to whom it is given, those who experience it, those it's a part of their life, so they understand this. He said there are some eunuchs that are born from their mother's wombs, eunuchs. Now, most conservative right-wing preachers will tell you that a eunuch is somebody who's been castrated. Bless God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. All right. Well, then, first of all, we have to assume that they are castrated by an individual. Somebody has to do the job. The Lord said they come out of the womb and they're already a eunuch. So somebody got up inside mama and did the job while that poor baby was still inside the mother. Well, now that's stupid. Of course it's stupid. We know it's stupid. The real point of the matter is, uh, simply stated, 
Some folk just born that way. That's the, that is the bottom line. Some folks just born that way. Mr. Falwell, some folks just born that way. You want to know the answer to why there are people in this world who are different than you? Some folks just born that way. You want to understand why there are gay and lesbian people in the world? Some folks just born that way. It's that simple. You may not get it because it ain't given to you, but I get it because I've lived with it. And then there are those, the Lord said, who have been made that way by men. They have been castrated. They have been uh, rendered useless sexually with a member of the opposite sex by another human being. But that doesn't always mean that they have to have had certain parts of their body tampered with. There are many people today who have had experiences of, mol of molestation and rape and abuse growing up. And for whatever reason, they cannot function normally sexually with a member of the opposite sex. Even if they wanted to, they couldn't. Even if they absolutely... And, and I'm going to tell you, I have a cousin who's lived this exact experience. She got married. And she, to be frank, is so dysfunctional when it comes to sex that she just really, it was just useless for her to even try to be in a relationship with a man. I didn't make her a lesbian, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that it, it rendered her useless, it rendered her unable to really function. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? So while there are some who are born that way, the Lord turns around and says, and then there are some who are made that way. So you know what, Mr. Falwell? You claim on one hand that people choose this. Then in the next breath you say, well, they're made that way because mama is too overbearing or daddy don't love them enough. Well, I've got news for you. Whether you're born this way or whether you're made this way by somebody, the reality is God does not fault the victim for the crime. Hello? God does not hold the woman who's been raped responsible for the rape. He holds the man who raped her responsible for the rape. God does not hold the man, uh, he does not hold the child who's been molested responsible. He holds the pervert who molested the child responsible. God does not hold the daughter who has been uh, molested by her dad responsible. He holds the dad who molested his daughter responsible. Do you hear what I'm saying? And this concept that God is so narrow and so foolish and so uh, unable to see the reality and the truth of situations. No, the Lord answered that question when he addressed the eunuch, the issue of the eunuch. And he said, some are born that way, some are made that way. Some people say, well, is it nature or nurture? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It totally doesn't matter. Whether it is nature or whether it is nurture, it doesn't matter. Because if you're rendered a eunuch by either circumstance, it simply means you're not able to function with a member of the opposite sex. Eunuchs were able to function with one another. I'm not trying to be vulgar, but I want you to follow me this morning. What do you think? Eunuchs weren't able to have any kind of sexual contact with anybody? Of course they could. They couldn't reproduce. There's a lot of things you can do without reproducing. Go to the movies? No. <laughs> There's a lot of things you can do. All right. I'm going to try and cut this short tonight, uh, this morning. But I just, I wanted to kind of encourage you to understand today. I had a lady write me on the Internet the other day, and she said, I just want to understand, are you pro-gay, anti-gay, or what? And I could just tell by the tenor of her, of her thingy that it wasn't a good letter. <laughs> and I wrote her back, and I said, man, we are fully affirming of all people 
especially gay, lesbian people. That we accept them and understand that they stand before God as a eunuch. The Bible stating some are born that way, some are made that way. That, and that's how we look at it. And if you can deal with that, come on, be with us. If you can't, then stay away. Amen. All right? But I want you to remember today, everybody, we all have a child within us. If you can look past the external and look toward the internal and see the child within, we'll be in a better place and we'll live in a better world. Amen? All right. Would you stand with me this morning? I promise I try to keep it simple. Normally, that's not how I preach, but... That's how I exhort. <laughs> and we're going to go over to St. Luke's here in a bit. Amen. You know, I'm going to go ahead and close the service with prayer, if you would.